All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, we're going to uh, review a theme that we've been using all semester. And it's called the four elements of self-knowledge. And we do this to help us better understand how to examine our history, our culture, and ourselves. Four elements of self-knowledge. And so, in the humanities, we have to get an understanding of the events and circumstances that have shaped our environment. And so, the elements that we have identified come in the form of questions. What is my origin? What is my meaning? What is my morality? And what is my destiny? Where am I going to wind up? And so we have uh, so much information to plug into uh, this paradigm. And that's what this course is about. It is about using the art and literature of African Americans to answer uh, these basic questions. Now we have some vocabulary words that we have uh, created. and. As you all know, it is necessary for us to at least be able to, in a very crude way, uh, draw a uh, topography of where we come from, our points of reference. And we have several different points of reference. It all depends on time and space and place. But understand that we begin the discussion of the African-American experience in West Africa. It does not, uh, our discussion in total does not limit ourselves to West Africa because we can discuss Nile Valley civilization, which was of, co of course happened in ancient times and it's referred to as ancient Nile Valley civilization. Yeah. What? Well, we should know this. It's meaning. Uh, it's yeah. Kind of yeah. We put we put this on the board several times, so you don't have to write that down anymore. But it's origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Okay. Now, if we talk about ancient times, we could talk about ancient Nile Valley civilization. But when we began to talk about the African American experience, we're talking about West Africa. Okay. And we're talking about uh, the creation of a business relationship called the transatlantic slave trade. Okay? Transatlantic slave trade. Now what you want to do is associate this term with business because that's what it was. It was a business arrangement. And it had many different people uh, involved in it. Right? You also have to understand that prior to the transatlantic slave trade, where was the location of the slave trade previous to the transatlantic slave trade? Trans-Saharan slave trade, good. So before there was a transatlantic slave trade, there was a trans-Saharan slave trade. And this, in so many different forms, still continues to this day, okay? The trans-Saharan slave trade. You also have the Moorish invasion of Europe, which preceded the transatlantic slave trade. And a lot of people don't know, but hopefully you all will research the effect that black African Muslims, Christians, and Jews had on bringing Europe into uh, enlightenment. So these two lead up to the transatlantic slave trade. In 1492, is a good date for that. Most of the time, people associate 1492 with Christopher Columbus discovering America, right? Well, we know that Christopher Columbus didn't discover anything, okay? That's a major point. You already had people in um, South America, in Central America, in the islands, and so he becomes the point man for the transatlantic slave trade. So behind every little piece of, of history, you have a mystery. And so you have what has been revealed versus what has been concealed. Okay? So what has been concealed is the fact that Christopher Columbus 
uh, actually jumped off the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the birth of the African American experience begins in a distance from West Africa to the islands, and then that will change as the, the trade expands, but we refer to this distance between West Africa and the islands as the what? The Middle Passage. And the Middle Passage shapes the African American consciousness, all right? The Middle Passage and everything that would come from it. And you have to ask yourself the question, what was it like on those slave ships? Okay, that's the question that you're gonna ask. And that's the, a lot of the research that you'll, uh, that you'll embark on because, and I'm gonna put some names on the board, and let's get these names. These are some people whose names we need to know, people that we need to know. One is Dr. Bobby, it's not me, Wright. Dr. Bobby Wright was a black psychiatrist and he wrote on the psychopathic racial identity and he talks about the slave ship experience and he talks about how the experience that black people have had has carried on from one generation to another beginning with this chaos, right? There's an African term for the Middle Passage and it's called the Ma'afa. Yeah, I'll put that term in your notes, my alpha. And at the end of class, I'll underline everything in red that you need to know, okay? Everything I'll underline in red will be a vocabulary word. But Dr. Uh, Bobby Wright is one. He passed away. Dr. Amos Wilson is another. Dr. Neely Fuller, and I think he's still living. I'm supposed to interview him on the radio a couple of couple of uh, months, hopefully, if I can get it. But all of these are black psychiatrists, psychologists, black uh, academicians that make the relationship, the psychological relationship between what happened on that boat and what's happening to African Americans now. Now, one thing I will say is that y'all are scientists, okay? You all are scholars. And I'm not uh, orientating you on this information just for you to say what Dr. White said. Forget what Dr. White said, try to learn what they said, okay? Because I'm just a community. Uh, also, uh, you have uh, Drs. Cobb and Greer. Right, and them didn't, he didn't necessarily like their conclusions. But that, these are sources that you can use to prove the point, okay, of the psychological relationship between the Africans that took the boat ride, which is referred to as the what? The diaspora, thank you. And those Africans that were born in the continent which are, which are also members of the diaspora, they make the connection, right? Now, I don't expect for you to know who these people are. Uh, put in your notes, Dr. Fred Spanon, he's dead. Dr. Rod, Dr. Uh, Walter Rodney. <clears throat> but this is what I expect. Now, this may be an overblown expectation, but I expect for you to Google these people. At this level of where you all are now, I expect for you to take your own precious time, not because of an assignment, but because this information is necessary to your understanding, go on YouTube or wherever and Google these people and glean from what it is that they observe, right? That's what you should be spending your time doing now. And so in the past we did childish things, but now it's time for us to get an understanding, right? And the way we get our understanding is using our time, energy, and effort uh, to do this thing right, okay? So you have the diaspora, and we said basically there are, and it could be more, but there are three points to the diaspora, right? We'll put this as, as terms and concepts, right? We got some people, 
Now let's get some terms and concepts. Well, we said there were three basic headquarters to the diaspora. First was the islands, right? Then you have Brazil population-wise. There's a lot of Africans in Brazil. Did you know that? Now, you don't see that on television, right? Because television does not reveal these things. When they had the uh, soccer games in Brazil, Pele, y'all ever heard of Pele? <clears throat> Who was Pele, everybody? P-E-L-E? -E. -E. Well, yeah, there you go. He was, he's Mr. Soccer. He's the Michael Jordan of soccer, right? Well, anyway, Pele was very upset. He's an African. Very upset that when the, when the, uh, when the World Cup was in his hometown, they didn't acknowledge the millions of African poor. And watch this, neither did the World Cup coming to uh, South America impact the millions of African diaspora. Now, you also have a cultural hub, arguably, in Harlem. So you have population, Brazil, but cultural, up until recently, all things black were in Harlem. Right? If you wanted to know the, the total uh, or get a good uh, panoramic view of the African diaspora, you will go to Harlem. How many of y'all been to Harlem? See, you need to go. Brother Herschel is, from, is from, from up there, so naturally going to Harlem for him is like us going to Prattville. But you need to go to Harlem, right? So you need to tell your parents after summer semester, you're going to take off the fall, you ain't going to college, and you're going to travel. And they gonna pay for it. Yeah, tell them. Tell them you need to go to Harlem. But what are you looking for? You see? When I went to Harlem, my sister, one of my sisters lived there, I saw everything I needed to see. I saw buildings named after Rosa Parks. I saw streets named after Martin Luther King. I saw uh, houses and buildings that a lot of the people whom we're talking about are associated with. But it was during a time period called the Harlem Renaissance. What's the Renaissance? All right, re-beginning be, re of what? A rebirth of what? Okay. How do you know when you're going through a Renaissance? Put this in your notes, put stars by it, and you're not gonna appreciate this until long after I'm dead. <laughs> Sound like I'm angry, right? Well, you never know. But a renaissance has everything to do with a rediscovery of what? And people go through a renaissance when they rediscover themselves. You see? Now here's the star. This is what I want you to want you to get to understand it. It is the rediscovery of self through knowledge, but that knowledge is literary. Whenever a group of people put reading and writing as a top priority, those people are about to take over. Okay? Whenever people put what? Reading and what? Writing, writing as a priority, those people are about to what? Take over. That's how the Muslims were able to build empires in the north and in the east. Because in Islam, it is mandatory that you learn how to read and write. That's why one of the first, we'll put him over here as a, as a person, one of the first slave narrators, okay, one of the first slave narrators was actually a Muslim, Omar Saeed. He wrote the first slave narrative, arguably, but he wrote it in Arabic. So don't be surprised if a lot of African identity, African American identity, is associated with Islam. It's associated with Islam because of the requirement that you learn how to read and write. 
and the church made that a priority, but it was not as a pronounced cultural priority as it is uh, in Islam and so forth. So Islam far outsees other people in placing a priority on reading and writing. Y'all understand that? A lot of people that came over on the boat, a part of the diaspora, were Muslim. <clears throat> Okay? A, a good group, a good population. So you're going to find traces of the African diaspora and Islam in South America, a little in the islands, and in America, it kind of comes about as a result of the Renaissance period. Okay? But Islam is just as black as Christianity and Hebrewism. It's all, you know, all basically defined by the same people. So you have the, the diaspora which is, has three basic hubs to it. The islands, which was the first stop. South America, which eventually had more people in Brazil than any other place. And then Harlem, culturally, and you can still see this today uh, when you go up there. And some of my students say, I need to put Atlanta up there. <laughs> and we will, we'll put Atlanta up there too. Because Atlanta's kind of taken over. We got a lot of Africans in Atlanta, and I always have had. But you got to show them a lot of Africans in Atlanta, okay? So we've got the we've got uh, the diaspora up here, Middle Passage, uh, transatlantic slave trade, and so understand that politically, what do you know politically? <clears throat> the islands has shaped African American consciousness. Politically, probably more than any other place in the in the diaspora, the islands, right? Can anybody name a event that took place in the islands that might shape the way we look at things in 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 the past during slavery? Anybody think of something? The Haitian Revolution. How many of you have ever heard of that? The Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution was critical. All right? So we'll put Haitian Revolution here. Diaspora, Middle Passage, Transatlantic Slave Trade. Now we'll put Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is important, 1791 to 1803. The Haitian Revolution is important because these Africans fought back. <clears throat> they organized themselves, and you had a very wicked triangle you had. And see, y'all got to get this part, all right? You got to get this. This is important. And you're going to find this throughout the world, all right? You're going to find this set up. You're going to have the Europeans who are the colonizers, right? Remember we use that term? Now, when we say colonizer, what do we mean? There's three things that the colonizers do. We identify, let's put that word up here, colonizer. Or colonialism. There are three things that the, that the colonizer does, and there may be more. But there are three we're going to identify. What does it do? Look at your notes. Huh? They impose their culture on the people whom they have what? Oppressed. We say exploited. And oppressed. That's a good word, too. They exploited what from, from the people? Their resources. What type of resources? Natural, oh man, we're going to cut class today, y'all got it. Natural and human, right? You see this in Africa, you see this wherever you have the colonizers. And then what else did they do first before they did any of these things? They occupied the land. They take land that's not theirs, they take resources that are not theirs, and they impose their culture on people. Right? Y'all got that? And we can talk about the different ways that they impose their culture on people. Right? 
So you have the colonizer. He's not in his own land. He's in somebody else's. This thing is not going to work unless they take other people's land. That's why when it's time to talk about reparations, where might we need to start? That's right. Somebody tell what we just said. Land. That's right. Before you talk about compensation monetarily, right. you need to talk about property. That's right. Now here's the thing. You're talking about property, both real, what's real property? What does that mean? Real estate. What is real property? You know what real estate is? What is real estate? Okay, it's houses, it's land. Real property and intellectual. Do you know, and I'm getting way off subject, do you know if Nat King Cole's family sued Capitol Records for what Nat King Cole was worth, they would owe Nat King Cole's family $20 billion? $20 billion. Nat King Cole alone. Forget African reparations. That's enough right there, isn't it? We all Nat King Cole family, don't we? <laughs> $20 billion off of him alone. You see? So reparation, before we ever talk about conversation, we want our land back and we want our intellectual property back. Right? That would mean Bible, Quran, Torah, Othello. <laughs> this some deep stuff. See? All that stuff William Shakespeare did. You see? They go on and on. Elvis. Where did Elvis get all that stuff from? Get how to dance. Rolling Stones, where they get their music from? You ever heard of a guy named Billy Preston? Musician? Well, Billy Preston made most of that music. Yeah. Led Zeppelin, the Who, all of that stuff. All those guys got that stuff. And did, they, did those people who created it, did they get any money for it? See? Little Richard, you ever heard of Little Richard? Okay. So, in Haiti you had this, you had the Europeans, then you had their mulatto offspring. Now this is important. What kind of triangle is this? We got the Africans out here in the field. They isolated from everything. Now this looks like geometry, doesn't it? Now here's the gig with this. Geometry is philosophy. Put that in your notes. Geometry is what? For every geometric shape, there is a way of thinking. You got that there? Right there? For every geometric shape, there is a what? Way of thinking. You see? This is also a social, this is a legal diagram. My, my degree is in law and philosophy. I didn't know that, but law is philosophy. <laughs> I didn't know that until I got my degree. I was taking philosophy classes too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this looks like a geometric shape, does it not? But this is actually a social uh, paradigm. You have the mulatto. What's the mulatto? A mixture of the European and the what? The African. These two coming together creates this. And as colonialism grows, what do you think happens to this group? Does it get smaller or bigger? It gets bigger. Now here's the thing. You look at the proximity that the European are to their mulatto children. It's pretty close, isn't it? This group is isolated totally, aren't they? Right? This group here is not in the mix at all. Right? So your revolution has more to do with the relationship between the mulatto and the European parents than it has to do with the African that is displaced and dispossessed because of hard labor. <clears throat> okay? This group here is focused on work. Now they revolt and rebel now. They run away. Right? They do little guerrilla tactics, right? They use terror. But this group here and this group here have a very unusual relationship and you have to understand it and here it is. This group the mulattoes thought that they were equal with this group. Did 
Isn't that important? They thought that. Now what made them think that? Because they were interacting with each other. Put in your notes, segregation, Jim Crow has to do with interaction. Nellie Fuller identified nine levels of, in, nine areas of interaction. Right? And we'll go over that on Monday. Somebody remind me to go over that on Monday about what Nellie Fuller said those nine areas of interaction are because you'll be able to put, apply that in your own life and see if it's true or not. Y'all are constantly trying to prove or disprove the theories that these people came up with and you do it by your real life experience. Now, the areas of interaction here were very close. They were living together, sleeping together, marrying each other, speaking the same language. Is that important? Okay. This group out here was speaking traditional African language. They maintained a lot of their con African concepts. That's what isolation does. You're putting in those maroon community. You're able, when you maroon yourself, when you run away, when you're isolated, you tend to keep yourself to yourself because you're not interacting with a lot of diverse people, right? People ask me, you know, what I'm gonna do when I retire, and, you know, what I plan to do when I retire and whatever. I plan to fall so far off the map and the radar, it ain't funny. You ain't gonna be able to find me. You ain't gonna be able to, I ain't gonna be able to, you too, I ain't gonna be able to do it, nothing. I'm gonna go so deep in the hood where can't nobody ever find me. Good, that's, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to, uh, develop serious, intimate interactions with other people who I know don't have my people's best interests at heart. Does that matter? Still got my house in the hood. My people didn't know that. They know I'm coming back. They always ask me when they see me, when you're coming back, I say, it'll be real soon. Because I can function now. I can't function in other places. That's, that's just how I am. That's important because when you are isolated from this right here, you tend to have a sense of identity. These people are going to have a serious identity crisis after a while. They look like they master. They got the master's blood in them. Put Frederick Douglass down. Frederick Douglass came to a serious crisis because his, he heard the news that his master was his father. That's an identity crisis. Talk about asking the question of what your origin is. Well. Your origin is going to play out in all of these other questions. You see? Your origin is going to play, play out in all of these other questions. You see? So is it possible for you to be a member of a family, but you consider your origin to be totally different? Hmm? How many, okay, let me put it like this. How many of y'all go to a family reunion and you just feel out of place? Oh, I'm the only one? Okay, all right, well. <laughs> the more knowledge you get, the more of an outcast you might be. But the mulattoes and the Europeans were interacting at every level. You think they weren't having similar discussions? Put in those French Revolution. The French Revolution was taking place, and all of these discussions were going on about what freedom means, about uh, what life means, about the true uh, facets of government, the relationship between government. You think they were not involved in those conversations too? Mm, they were. Could they read and write? Yes. Did they understand the concepts, the people, the phrases? Yes. They're eating where the Europeans eat. They're, into, they're wearing the same clothes. They know the same music know the same dances, studying the same stuff, but, okay, this is a big but, but this group was citizens, first class, and these people were second class. Now, is that a problem? Now, this group here, they knew what they were. But these two right here, and this group is getting bigger and bigger. 
How long do you think it took for this group to want what they had? <clears throat> what do you think, if you had those nine levels of interaction, I'm going to name some of them, uh, politics, uh, economics, entertainment, law, government, Sex, um, education, and the other two. If you're interacting and eight of these, but one of them is missing, there's something that this group wants that this group has. And this right here, if y'all understand this, this will get you a better understanding of why it seems like African Americans can't get ahead. Right? As a group, is it possible that we lack the understanding of something? When you study the Haitian Revolution, these people found out what it was. You see? And when they found out what it was, they decided to declare, to declare war on that group. You see? The first aspect of the revolution took place between those people who thought they were first class citizens only to find out that they weren't. You see? That's why this word, what's that? I know I got terrible hand right. What is it? That's the symbol for it? Equals. What's so special about that word? What does that word do? You see? Put this in your notes, and this is a life lesson. It's not going to be on the test, but it'll be on the test of life. Okay? Put this in your notes. You will not, you will not, feel inferior. You will not feel inferior to someone if you know what they know. You will not feel inferior to someone if you what? Know what they know. You will not feel inferior to someone if you what? Know what they know. know, what they know. But what is it that the colonizer knows that the colonized does not know? What's the best way to keep somebody in the slave? What's the best way? You ain't got to do it physically. Yes, sir. Thank you. What? Hold on. Think about what you just said. What's the best way to keep somebody in a slave? Is to make them think that they are what? Okay. That's a good, that's a, yeah, you're right. That is a way. But what about this? And I'm trying to think who said this. The best way to make keep somebody a slave is to make them think they're free. Give them is called manumission. Put that word in your notes. Man, you, mission. Okay. The best way to keep somebody in the slavery is to make them think they're free. If you give them enough benefits, will they ever seek freedom? <clears throat> You know that when this little four-year, five-year stint is over, you may have to move back home. Okay, more, more of you than you think. Now, what's the problem with you moving back home? Because you've got a sense of freedom now, right? You can go and come when you want to come. You don't have to answer to nobody. You, you can live your life the way you want to. But if you have to move back home, what happens? Mama rules. Why does she rule? Because you're in her house, you have no money, you have no means of support, and then you try to get means of support, and what do you discover? A lot of people living with mama now. A lot of people have moved. I mean, they in their 30s and 40s, they moved, they moved back home. Why can't they become independent? See, that's the thing. That's the thing. 
In this system, you can keep people at bay by making them think they're equal, by giving them a little bit of these nine points, but never enough to dictate what they are. You see? You can be thrown bones, or you can get certain things to make you, just because you live next to somebody else, does that mean that you have what they have? Why? Does, why, why might that mean that you have what they have? Okay, I have a, a, a neighbor of mine, a kid lives down the street. I've been married 26 years. I'm 49. All right? I have been working all of my known life. All right? And my wife and I, we have a house. This guy's young. He's been married maybe five years. Okay, just got into his career. My wife and I, we've been in the our career for a while. Right? He bring he pulls up in a brand new Mercedes Benz. I'm out there planting some flowers in my flower garden. And he says, look, Dr. White, I'm trying to be like you. I had to stop him right there. Because there's no way for a 26-year-old to be like a 49-year-old. Impossible. Mm -hmm. Even if Lil Wayne pulled up in a Bugatti or whatever, and he said, look, Dr. White, I'm trying to be like you. There's no difference between he and the kid down the street who's just now getting started and decided to buy a copy of Mercedes Benz. Why? What factors will come into play? Now these factors are absolute. And you see it on television all the time how people have all this money rolling in and they lose it. That's pure mathematics. If you fail mathematics class, if you fail calculus, you, you're going to be in your chest like them. It's all math. Yes, sir? Okay, and what is it about longevity? What, what, okay, what does my, what does my neighbor need to know about me for him to uh, correctly say that he is like me? Go ahead. I, I okay, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Here's what, this is what needs to happen, and here's, this is another life lesson. I told y'all learn life lessons from me, and, I, and really you'll learn what not to do more than what to do. But here's the thing, whenever somebody is hanging around you, you hang around them, y'all cool, whatever, what is it that you need to know about them before the relationship can go any further? Be it a roommate, be it somebody you cool with, I don't agree with, I don't use all those terms, but what is it, if somebody's gonna be a part of your intimate circle, or even feel like they're close to you, what is it that you need to know about them? Where they come from. Where they from, what else? Okay. Well, here's the thing. You need to know how they make their money. You need to know where that, where that cat or that sister getting their money from. Why is that important? Because it might be you. See, they may be hanging around you because they're about to take advantage of you. See? How do you categorize people that have no visible means of income? What do you do? What must you do? See, this will prevent dudes from breaking in your apartment when you're gone. Most of the time, somebody breaking in your house is somebody you know. They just ain't got nothing. You, you need to know before you let people in your apartment, let people close to you, even let you in the car, you need to know where they're getting their money from. Because if they don't have no money, that means they're desperate. And that means you ain't their friend. You kind of divert from the topic, but it's super perfect. My neighbor thought that he was equal with me is it necessary that a 26-year-old had the same stuff a 49-year-old have? Is that, is that necessary? Where does that expectation come from? Thank you. And is that real? Why are all these, why are all these rappers broke? I mean, most of them. My wife and I were in a hotel in Atlanta. It was, it was a while back. And this, it, was, it was a rapper in there, several of them. And you know, I, I dropped off with rap, you know, after uh, I think maybe Common, maybe I kind of fell off after that. I don't like Common, but he's like the last one that you know, like listen to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's okay. He's, he's a little too nice. Yeah, I, I respect him. But after that, you know, everybody else. But this brother, I mean, he's at the top of the chart. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> but 
He couldn't even get in the hotel. Yeah, I gave him a Bible. Him and they on TV now, actually. Right. Yeah, they from Florida. They on TV now. But they didn't have enough to get their hotel stuff. Said, Listen, as long as you're looking at television, television gonna always paint a false picture. These people have nowhere near the money that you think they have. Now this kid, he assumed that I had a lot of money, but he didn't know what. Where I was getting it from. You see, now watch this. What if you are taking your paycheck to try to compete with somebody who grandparents left for money? It's gonna be hard to catch up. You won't. Because grandparents, you getting money that you didn't earn is called wealth. See, it came from somewhere else. Your grandparents worked for it. And when your grandparents died, you inherited it. So that's a launch pad for you. So you may buy a car because of a tax issue, not because of a luxury issue. So it may actually work towards your good because that car actually could be a part of your business and it's not only a tax break, but it's a write-off too. The expenses on it. My brother working on that. I told him to take it back, tell the salesperson that you were off your medicine when you bought it, and that you're in the process of getting back stabilized. You see? Because they'll, if, if, they, if you're mentally ill, they'll, they're not trying to take it back. Just tell them. Tell them, look, I'm a family six credit and I bought this and I didn't know what I was doing. There's the key, and if you could give me something, you know. Me, whatever, you know, I just leave, but I can't do it. You see, that's what this is. You can think that you're a part of something, but you don't have the fundamental aspect of it. Well, these people figured out what the fundamental aspect was and put this in your notes. Their response was to fight back physically. That's how the revolution got started. The revolution got started when the second class folk who thought they were citizens discovered that they were not. Because remember I said, will you consider yourself inferior to somebody if you know what they know? The answer is no, you won't. That's why you'll find a lot of your revolutionary African and African American people were actually trained by Europeans. That's right. And were very close in proximity to Europeans. Nat Turner was very, put him in your notes, Nat Turner had a very good working relationship with white people. That's what shocked everybody. What shocked them was the fact that Nat was, I mean, <laughs> but Nat was so close to him, Nat discovered, man, these folk ain't worth a quarter. These people aren't superhuman. They bleed just like I do, and I'm finna prove it. But this group here declared war on that group because they thought themselves equal to that group. You see? They didn't appreciate that they were gonna end up having to fight the French, the Spanish. Do you think they can? The British. How many other people in the world can, can boast about the fact that they beat the French, the Spanish, the British, and the Americans? It started with this group. Now, what made this group so important? Because they had access to basically the same information. It's just data. It's, it, who has access to the information is going to win. See? Clemson had more information than the University of Alabama did. That's why they won. They found out something that Alabama was doing it was very simple, and they exploited it at the right time in Alabama. Well, it was the same with this. Them Haitians figured out the weaknesses of them people and took it out. They didn't hesitate. The Don Show didn't hold back. And when this group enters the break, the only thing that this group says is, hey, what took y'all so long? So you have, a, you have a, almost a united front of fighting between these two groups that the colonialist system, what did they do to them? This group, excuse me, this group was just as isolated from each other as this group was. You see? So 
This group here in relation to the mulattoes was just as different as this group in relation to the colonizers and the Europeans. But what happens? When this group moves in, what happens to this angle right there? What happens to it? See, that's geometry. As these group gets closer, that group gets further and further away, doesn't it? You see? So it is the second class that's the first to revolt. That's why Negro education has to be controlled. Putting in those Carter G. Wilson. And then we'll stop. Carter G. Wilson. What book did Carter? What, well, he wrote a bunch of books. But the book that he's most known for is Miseducation of the What? Miseducation of the Negro. Miseducation is so important because miseducation will always teach you second classness. Never first classes. You see? So where do you get the knowledge that teaches you first classes? Where does that come from? Is how many of you in business? In the business building, business school? Nobody? Now does that mean that you're not gonna be a millionaire? No, it doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> uh -uh. My dad my dad was pretty much a millionaire and he was a biochemist. But he knew business because he knew the street. That's what did it. But he picked up something fundamental that <clears throat> schools were not teaching, and they still not teaching to this day. You will not go to any business school in America, and there'll be a class called Big Balling 101. How to get paid 101. It ain't there. They'll teach you theories, they'll teach you concepts, they'll teach you this, that, and other. And then if you can match their theories and concepts, if you teach them that you understand those theories and concepts, then they'll give you a grade. But that still doesn't mean that you're gonna go out and make some money. Yeah, yeah. Where do you learn how to make money? Where are the places, why do you think Dr. White wants you to travel? What might you pick up that you might not get here? I mean, cause look at the people sitting next to you. They just as poor as you are. And poor people hanging together, what is that? Poor. That's poor. <laughs> Money will never come from poor. <laughs> you poor, I poor, that's it. We are gonna be poor. That's the problem. Whenever you get a rap and stuff, talk about, we start out with nothing, and you go in with nothing. <laughs> because our friend made a song, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You gotta have something. If you want to be the same guy we mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. He don't know what he's talking about. Where are you gonna get that information? You see? These people petitioned France for full citizenship, and France said no. They wanted the right to vote, they wanted the right to dictate on these nine. I forget what the other two are. Forgive me. Well, you can bet I have it on Monday. And France said no. And you had brothers in the French army that already knew military warfare. The Maroons, they already knew military warfare. They fought in a totally different way than the French did. That's why they won. But you had Africans in the French army. You had Africans that were trained militarily. To saw that over to was one of them. He was only one of them, it was a bunch of them. And they knew how to strategize, and they knew how to take out the French army. How many people can boast that they beat Napoleon's name? Now, as a result of these Africans fighting and winning, we've only got the one thing in the islands. I've done this subject of a disservice. We've only got the one thing in the islands. But as a result of the Haitian victory, France had to sell off their property in America, and that was called a Louisiana purchase. So what does that tell you about African resistance? Which is going to be what we're going to talk about on Monday. What does it tell you about African resistance? Put this in your notes, put stars by it. When I'm dead and gone, you'll, you'll, you won't get it when I say it. You have to sit there and think about it. 
And this is because of the way the world is set up. We didn't create a system like this. It's just the way it is. Whenever we win, everybody else loses. That's not our fault. Whenever we win, everybody else loses. People can make you think you have won when you really have not. But the way you know you really won is everybody else loses because of what? what might you, why might you think that's the case? What might, what, what might you think the reason for this arrangement is, is that when you win, everybody else loses? Why might that be the case? What do you say? Oh. Okay, let me ask you this. Because you're, you're an athlete, right? Okay. Do your friend, do your friends ever bet on games? You? Okay, and when you lose, what, what, and they bet, they bet it on you, how might they treat you? I guess they bet on you. Yeah, they bet on you to win and you lost. Uh -huh. Might that reflect the way they treat you? Yeah. Okay. Why? Because I guess you know, they are hating you, but you let them down. Okay, now, now, okay. now that relationship is exploitative. They're, they're using you to get money, right? But well, what happens if that breaks down? Where are they going to get their money from? OK, see what I'm saying? Here's the thing with this. Because so much was invested in Haiti, everybody was getting filthy rich off Haiti. When Haiti said no more, what happened to everybody else's economy? Plummeted. Because everybody was getting their money off of what? Over Haiti. When Haiti said no, that was it. The French had to sell off all of their property. You see? Did the Haitians create that? Did the black Haitians create that? Everybody, no, they did not. But is it possible for the people, for people to be making so much money off you when you cut that relationship off? There is no way for them to make any money that way ever again. Is it possible that other people's wealth comes from you because you've given it to them, and when you say, I'm going to change this relationship, they go to the poorhouse? Are there relationships in the earth like that? That is the relationship between Europe and Africa. That's where we get Walter Rodney from. That's the relationship. It is a dependent relationship. Who's dependent on who? Europe is dependent on Africa. Africa is not dependent on you. Africa is not dependent on anybody. Africa does not need anybody for anything, but the world needs Africa to be exploited. That's how you're going to make the gazillions of dollars. That's the relationship. It is an exploitative relationship. So when Haiti went into civil war, well, what civil war? When they went into revolution, the terms, the economic terms changed totally. You see? And the pimp prostitute relationship, who needs who? The pimp needs the prostitute. The prostitute don't need the pimp. She really doesn't. He has to make her think that she does, but she really doesn't. She can break that relationship off at any time she wants to. And the pimp knows that. That's why he has to do certain things to try to force her to do it. But that relationship is destined to end, and he knows it. That's the relationship between Europe and Africa. Africa is eventually going to resist being pimp, and that's when you're going to have World War III. You're going to have World War III because people will not be able to. You will no longer have cell phones if the Congolese revolt. If the Congolese say no more, and they have a revolution, and they take over the coal tan that's in the Congo, the price of your cell phones are going to go through the roof because the people who are making the gazillions of dollars are not going to be able to make the gazillions of dollars no more. But people in the Congo will have running water. They'll have paved streets. They have electricity that's more than once or twice a week for a couple of hours. They'll be able to build for themselves what African people have been trying to build forever. 
But this exploitative relationship of colonialism has made that impossible. Right? All right, see all the money. And I have a test grade too. Any questions or comments? Questions? Making it in? Making it in? All right. So if y'all have drawn on the board like I've drawn on the board, you're utterly confused. But we will go over everything that we've gone over uh, today on Monday. And the more we rehearse it, the more we, and if you notice, we just repeat the same things over and over again. We just add a little bit to it each time. If you don't get it now, that's fine. You will get it. All right. Thank <laughs> you.